Today, what I'm going to talk about is Python and using Python with respect to embedded system development. And um, try to touch on some of the benefits of using it, and, uh, and more so how it can really help uh, a developer. A lot, a lot of the topics I'll cover, though, um, apply to Python in any, any context, really. So, just a little bit more. And if you have any questions, please. Feel free at any time. Uh, so, I'll just start with a quick overview of Python. Uh, Python is a high level interpreted language that's uh, dynamically typed, uh, which means that the type of any instance variable isn't known until runtime. Uh, Python's actually fairly mature now. Its first posting was, uh, its first sighting on the internet was in 91, and the first official release was 94, so that gives us about 14 years since the first official release. Uh, Python has a huge support community on the internet. There's forums, news groups, blogs, uh, a lot of documentation, uh, but most importantly, a lot of third party contributions in the form of packages. And most Python source code is uh, released under a very liberal license. It's comparable to, uh, it's, it's actually called the Python Software Foundation license, and it's comparable to an MIT or VSD style license. And then maybe a quick overview on what an embedded system is, in case uh, you're not familiar. Um, embedded system is, an embedded system is really just a generic name for an application-specific microprocessor or microcontroller-based system. Um, embedded systems are everywhere. I mean, there's cell phones, MP3 players, cable, satellite set-top boxes, TVs, TV, wireless router, cars probably got a half a dozen or more. They're basically everywhere. Now, with respect to developing for an embedded system, uh, typically there's two different environments that you, you deal with, two different system computing platforms. Uh, first, you have the developer's environment um, where all your tools live. Uh, your, your, cross, your editor, your cross compiler, linker. Um, and that's where uh, you do the process of you know, editing and compiling and then downloading that to your target environment and test your, your product. And this cycle repeats until development is complete.
so what type of embedded system do we have at Sion? It's basically a chassis-based system with many line cards. Um, we have two redundant common controllers that act, in, act as masters for the system, and then uh, a host of line cards that are slaves and perform the application-specific All, almost all of our cards have a very powerful embedded complex. It's a 1 gigahertz 32-bit power PC with a gig of RAM, 8 gig of flash. It's running a full Linux operating system. And um, there's gigabit Ethernet links to the outside world as well as um, for interconnectivity between those, those line cards. Um, it's important to realize for us that we, we, do, we really do have a powerful system. This isn't a microwave or a laundry machine. I mean, this is a, a really powerful system, which helps. Here's a graphic of our system. So this, this is the chassis. We have these are the line cards, and on the left are the, the common controllers. Um, these guys are going to be right now. Necessarily heard Python, you may or may not have any misconceptions or concerns about the languages from the onset. Do you have any using it? It's interpreted so it's slow. It's interpreted so it's slow, sure. That's a, that's a pretty common one. It is uh, sometimes hard to, uh, it, or it, it's very easy to introduce bugs in, into a Python program because it's, it's dynamically interpreted. You won't run into the bug until you actually hit that branch that the bug is on. So if you make a typo, you might never know it's for a breaker or so. Sure, dynamic typing. Especially in error path cases. Mm -hmm. It doesn't actually blow up until you, you hit the error and you get in trouble. But that's a problem. Um, so I just came up with this list that um, you know I thought something that maybe I had or I thought someone might performance due to uh, the fact that it's interpreted. Um, and again, because it's interpreted, maybe it can't meet scaling requirements necessary for a large system. Um, the required white space indentation, that one's okay with it, but, uh, you know, coming from C, I was a little upset, <coughs> but I got over it, you know, literally in about 30 seconds. <laughs> In the industry as well, we know Python is used, you know, Google uses it for their app engine, but in telecommunications, I can't say definitively, but from my own experience, or my past working experience, or talking with any colleagues or potential candidates, um, I, I haven't seen much Python. It's usually C, C++, Java. Just one more concern. <clears throat> I'm concerned about being so far from the heart. Okay. Compared to C, sure. Especially for an uh, embedded application. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, hopefully I can touch on that and maybe you can see some ways to pack it in. Okay, so first off, Python is a high level language. And as you just said, a high level language is one that abstracts away the details of your underlying hardware. So, uh, which 
which in some, certain cases is a good thing, but we'll, we'll talk about how an embedded system is actually good thing. But from mm -hmm. this perspective, that's a good thing. Um, it also provides more abstract language constructs, constructs uh, to deal with things such as data structures, and algorithms, and memory management, ready, multi-core processing, or even multi-node processing. In comparison to something like C, where you're forced to deal with 8-bit character types or 32-bit integers, uh, pointers, arrays, registers, the Linux OS thread, the Windows OS thread, all that is abstracted away. In high-level language, fewer lines of code are required for the same functionality. And that's a benefit because fewer lines of code equate less fewer bugs, less code to read, and less code to maintain. And in industry, it's a team environment. Um, you know, you're never capable of just always 100% of the time writing new code. You're going to be either integrating to an, into an existing framework or collaboratively working with your teammates. Uh, so the less code to read, the less to maintain. Would you say there's anything about those bugs actually being more obscure because of the fact you're abstracted so yeah. much? Maybe the fewer number, but maybe they're nastier. Potentially. I, you know, I, I don't have the source for it, but I, I read a paper that basically stated that in general, there's no order of magnitude difference in between languages in terms of the number of lines of code to bugs. So if lines of code goes down, the number of bugs will go down as well. Uh, but at, at the end of this little section, we, we'll talk about that. So uh, with Python, you get built-in powerful data structures. Um, it comes with associative arrays, which are called dictionaries, uh, lists, and tuple sets with full set notation uh, and functionality you know, intersection. Decks, heaps, bipos, queues. And since they're part of core Python, they're standardized. And, and that's really important because in C or C sure you can get all of those types of uh, functionality, but it's going to come from STL or maybe Boost or the ACE framework or uh, maybe it's homegrown by before you got there. And they're not standardized, so you're, you're constantly going to be relearning some new. Uh, way to use your core data structure. Well, with Python is standardized, you're in, you're in an environment today, you need to be it's the same. Um, Could that standardization be seen as a downside? If you're constantly seeing new ways of looking at the same data structure, and there's the potential for great uh, advances in everyone and uh, performance you can get out of those? Uh, sure, but uh, I would say at the application level, we're not necessarily looking to invent new data structures or, you know, we just want to use it to solve the problem that we're focusing on. Uh, maybe in another context where that was your primary focus, it could be. But the functionality of the data structure is the same. It's really just how you use it, um, how it's going to perform, you know, how does an STL vector perform compared to a uh, ACE vector. Is it going to have a bug because STLs use more, so ACE may be more prone to having errors? I don't know if that answers the question. You know, always satisfied. Um, you know, these data structures are also, they are written in C, um, so they're, they're, they're optimized and performant. And not only does uh, a large section of the Python community uses these data structures, but Python itself internally uses it as a building block. So uh, these data structures get huge coverage. They're well tested, They're out of box, performant, trustworthy. Okay. Um, with Python, we also get uh, a memory management subsystem. Uh, there's an automatic garbage collector that will free up a resource when there are no longer any references to it. 
And uh, references can be released in two ways. You can explicitly delete it, or you can it can or it can be an implicit um, deletion by reusing a reference and pointing at some other reference. And also there's no concept of a pointer natively. Which is good because Python uh, pointers are hard to learn for beginners. Um, maybe not here, but learning <laughs> program. Um, they're dangerous. Um, I mean, numerous models are due to errant point, pointer conditions or dangling pointers or double three or corrupt pointer. You know. In fact, I, I mean, I won't name specific names, but there are whole companies built, their whole business model is built around statically analyzing C and C++ code and finding these types of errors. These errors, they, just, they don't exist in Python. They, they can't. You can have logic bugs, but not, not just silly code mistakes of that nature. Um, all of the previous features add up to a language that is easy to learn and easy to use. Even our hardware team writes pretty good uh, Python code. Maybe they don't have to that. They're good at Python. First of all, you are dependent on a third party piece of software, the Python virtual machine. Um, depending on what platform you're running on, um, could dictate the, the performance or the quality. But it, it also, like any other third party application, it, it's like any third, other third party application you might use. It's also open source, um, so it's well maintained. If we find something, we can contribute to that. And in, in our usage in the last year and a half of, of heavy development, we, we had never experienced one fatal condition like a segmentation fault that was due to the Python virtual machine itself. In fact, I don't think we can say we found a single bug with Python virtual machine. We, we have, of course, had issues or fatal conditions, but it was actually due to some C or C++ code that we wrapped and integrated into Python. And then, um, as you mentioned, there, there can exist potentially non-obvious performance bottlenecks because you do have a lot of functionality packed into a line or two. Normally, okay, maybe that's not a big deal, not that big of a deal, but if you uh, or to put that in a very tight loop, for example, then, then it would show up. Um, but fortunately for us, Python provides uh, a very easy way to find those bottlenecks and um, an easier, easier way to fix them. So they can be resolved uh, really easily. But we'll, we'll look at performance later. Okay, so. The next thing about Python is that it is interpreted, and uh, we can talk about the advantages and disadvantages of using interpreting. So Python source code is compiled into an intermediate language the very first time it's run. It's, it's not the same as a, a C compilation, but it does. It is transformed from Python source to Python bytecode. You know, similar to Java or Java or .NET or any other interpreting language, except maybe Basic. Um, you know, and that's compared to a lower level language like C, where uh, the source code is compiled into machine bytecode executed natively on the byte processor. What's really good about being interpreted is that it becomes platform independent. Um, you know, assuming there's a virtual machine for your target, but there are, you know. And if it runs on Linux, it runs on Windows, or it runs on Mac, your source, or it runs on our embedded platform, or it runs on our phone. So remember the way back, the typical embedded engineer's workflow was 
edit, compile, download, test. Using the interpreted language, um, the workflow changes slightly. It's, it's edit and test. The compile and download are removed now. Uh, just, just one sub note. I mean, you still technically have to download um, your, new, your new source file, but that's not the same as necessarily as a big binary. Coming up, I'll, I'll address that even further. But what's important is no more comp compilation, no more download. Big download. So if we're able to place a simple editor on the target, we now are able to perform a full development cycle locally on the target. And, and you know, that's how I'm saying there's no download. And, and the reason for that is the interpreter is part of the virtual machine that already resides on the target. And you know, in, 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 in any given development cycle, in the traditional embedded environment, um, we may execute and fail, and then realize it was some silly mistake, you know, off by one or some, something silly. Uh, the point is the editing cycle may only take a few seconds. But that edit, through dependencies and uh, just the way C setup might, might invoke a recompilation or relink, it could take uh, orders of magnitude more. And in this, in this new cycle right here, that is all gone. So edit, test, edit, test. And if you, if you, if you had to compound the time spent wasted waiting for the compilation, and then downloading over the lifetime of the software feature, I mean, it, it quickly becomes pretty obvious how much time and productivity is lost. Um, excuse me. Okay. I actually just want to jump ahead of this. So, it's just, it's funny, but it, it's, it's kind of the standard. What are you doing? Oh, my code's compiling. Oh, you can't do anything. You have to wait. And um, I won't name company, company to do it. But in my past, there was a product I worked on, and a full build, full compilation, and link to final uh, binary from a clean setup was eight hours. Um, if you were lucky, you didn't have to do that. You didn't, you didn't touch a header file that affected the, the entire system. But with a system that large, the dependencies were, were out of whack. So you may change something, it tells you only needs to recompile that. You go test it, it crashes for some crazy reason. And you go, oh, um, oh make clean, make go do something. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so with the, with the editor on the target environment, we can do that cycle locally. But if we take it one step further, it, and it's subtle, but very important. And in an embedded system, if we provide a good abstraction layer to our application-specific hardware, not, not the processor complex, but our hardware that is uh, you know, our secret sauce, we can have full simulation and testing facilities in our development environment with very little effort. I mean, it's the cost of just writing that abstraction layer in basically um, you know, bunking out the bottom half, or mock, like with a mock object or, or something along those lines. Now, you can do this in a traditional embedded environment, but typically it doesn't happen because it would take so much resources and, and uh, man hours dedicated to just that. You know, maybe for the iPhone we see a simulator, they've got the full force of Apple. Um, in my experience, Nothing was ever sponsored by the company to set up a simulation environment on the target. Some guys did, some guys, some of my colleagues did some work. And in the end, it really paid off, but it took him, you know, six months to do. Python, that's basically for free. And we've done that at Sign, and it's really important because our hardware is very expensive. Uh, we don't want to have a bunch of inventory lying around. Uh, so the hardware that we do have in house 
it's, it's being used constantly by developers or the hardware team that does something. So our hardware is scarce and expensive. Therefore, simulation is uh, key to us. And, and you know, and it has time to market benefits. You can develop and actually test your software before, let's say, the hardware is even in the house. So it's really important. Compile down one test and once you test, uh, we, can, we're, we are able to make code modifications on the target and test those. And uh, being interpreted facilitates the simulation on the development machine. Where is that? Okay. Mm -hmm. Let's see. Some other benefits of being interpreted are is that there are other virtual machines available. Jicon allows you to take your Python source code and integrate it under um, on top of the JVM, but you can then the Java version machine, but then you can make calls and access Java classes, and your Java classes can call to Python. Um, Iron Python is very similar, but uh, it's for .NET. Um, PyPy is, uh, is kind of a research virtual machine. Python implemented in Python, and they're trying to see ways to make the Python virtual machine better, faster, through this easy way to actually um, manipulate the virtual machine. And their their goal is through um, is by using just-in-time compilation and dynamic profiling of hotspots that have to have something that they claim to be faster than C. Because C can only be optimized once up front, whereas a, a dynamic language like this can be profiled and optimized continuously. That's in the way it's supposed to be. Then kind of the other spectrum is a VM called TinyPy, another one called TinyMite. Actually, I think TinyMite's more of a, well, it's, uh, TinyPy is a uh, very limited subset of Python functionality, but it does support um, classes, inheritance, uh, exceptions and garbage collection, garbage collection, and it fits within a 64k byte footprint. And then PyMite is more of just a really restricted subset of Python to some data. It's like a compiler, but it, it takes a really just the static and, the, and more of the uh, Python grammar to compile it. But for tiny footprints, again, I think they, it runs on with 8-bit APRs. Since it's not compiled um, and interpreted, it, it does um, go through an additional layer of execution in a virtual machine, and that will affect my kind of performance. Um, depending on what you start with in an embedded scenario, it may require a little larger footprint that requires maybe a beefier processor or more RAM or uh, more non volatile storage more difficult to protect your intellectual property. Um, Python bytecode is there on the target. Um, and since it's platform agnostic, it's, you know, there's just one decompiler that will return back to source. Everybody can, everybody can work on that one thing, and it exists. Um, and then, like, uh, like you mentioned earlier, since it is dynamically typed, certain errors are hard to find at that compilation phase. Um, however, there's a little good to that because it forces you as a developer to write more thoroughly unit tests and integration tests and use coverage tools to, to verify that you've executed every, um, every line. And there are static analyzers for Python, you know, PyLink, PyChecker, they do, they do, they do an okay job. Oh yeah, so we're talking about uh, Python bytecode. Just figured we have a little example here where, oops, this is a Python interpreter embedded in my project uh, presentation. I'll just define um, a silly function. 
called Foo. I'm sure that's favorite. And it'll print A plus 1. So now we can invoke the function and see that it prints it. Uh, the other really thing, neat thing about Python is that everything is uh, an object. So even functions are first class objects yeah, in Python. So if I just type foo and don't invoke it, uh, you get a little information about that object, function foo at memory address. Um, and then as part of Python standard library, it comes with a uh, Python disassembler. So the import keyword here is just bringing the, the dis module into my namespace. So I can see that this is everything in my namespace. So I can mock this, the function foo. So basically, uh, this has a function called this. And here through the help, you can see it disabled. Uh, this assembles classes and method functions. So we call we invoke this, pass it foo, and we get a pretty, pretty turned version of the Python bytecode. And the default Python virtual machine is a stack based machine, so uh, you can go through here. Uh, there's other monitors that allow you to uh, compose or modify by code and then turn it back into a to an executable function. So you do some pretty pretty neat things. a more natural language syntax uh, that's easier to read. Uh, there's less unnecessary, unnecessary, unnecessary syntactical noise to be distracted by. You know, there's no silly curly braces, no semicolon. It, uh, it makes a, a, a covenant session much more enjoyable. And actually, if I'm in Python mode for a long time, I have to go back and look at C. I mean, I love C. I, I worked in C for eight years, so I'm not, not trying to bash C. Looking at C, looking back at C, it's like a bad dream. And I would say that Python is easier to read than other high level languages um, compared to Ruby or uh, Erlang. And I would also say that anybody that's familiar with C or C would have no problem reading Python out of the box. It's that, it's that similar. Also, Python, ha Python has a tradition of encouraging common uh, syntactic idioms. And the core tenet of the Python philosophy is that there should be one, and preferably only one, obvious way to do it. And that really says a lot. Because having a single way to perform a task, and maybe throw in the required white space indication, uh, it leads to an improved, improved readability and an improved collaborative development effort. And everybody's, everybody's more likely to be on the same page for what's actually going on. In fact, I'd say reading Python is comparable to pseudocode. Um, I mean, I personally, if I'm going to flesh out an algorithm, or some new idea or some workflow algorithm in pseudocode. And how cool is it if that pseudocode is the implementation that, that it runs? You know, and that, that kind of says a lot to what Python does. It, just, it really gets out of your way and, and lets you focus on the problem at hand without having to deal with the necessary infrastructure just to be able to deal with the problem you're trying to uh, solve. So again, the bad related syntax. There, you know, these constructs may have a less obvious computational cost compared to a lower level language, which is more obvious in terms of comp computational cost per instruction. 
it's just kind of like the, the, something that's due to being high level and then the syntax of the curves. I don't want to say terse, but less. If you see a bunch of code, you might think it's doing a lot. Uh, okay, performance is a big issue. Um, to be honest, at Sion, we, we have not encountered a performance issue related to Python uh, that was not solvable so far. Our architect, well, in our architecture, first of all, is set up so hard real-time requirements, they're handled in hardware. We're not going to deal with those in software. Um, if our soft, you know, soft real-time requirements, anything that has to happen within 50, mil, 50 milliseconds, for, for example, will be handled in the kernel in C. We're not going to rewrite the kernel. But when we have encountered problems with Python, we resort to the built-in profiler in order to refactor. And uh, it does a, a deterministic profiling um, because at the top of the, the interpreter looking at the bottom, you can see every function we're going to. So we get, we get statistics back like the number of times every function was executed, the time spent on average inside of those functions um, is the time spent cumulatively for that function, and um, even a histogram of per line code counts, how many times did this line execute, did it execute at all. And, uh, you know, that's built in, it's easy to use, and it's comprehensive. You know, as compared to with C, out of the box, you get more of a heuristical sampling, where maybe you go and see where your program count is every, uh, at least the line so you go, go check and, and then build up a heuristics to say, well, I think most of the time I was here, which works, but it's not it's not deterministic, unless you have maybe a, some actual hardware assist to like insert it everywhere. Or something. Um, we, we do anticipate that there's always the possibility that there's something that can't be solved in Python for performance reasons. And, um, when that happens, we'll, we'll wrap it in C and provide a library and integrate it right into our Python code. So why would we want to do that? Okay, performance issues. Let's cover that. Um, another reason is, um, you know, sometimes we have to work with third-party libraries that maybe we purchased or download them. And they're in C, they're not going to rewrite those in Python. Just wrap them, integrate them, and we're done. And then our, you know, our personal Python usage story it wasn't, we weren't from the beginning Python, so we do have a lot of code that was C or C++. And um, we're actually in the process of converting those to Python. And I'll touch on a little bit about that at the end and some of the results we've seen. So how is it done? Um, C types is a built-in uh, as part of the built in standard library, and it just is really just a kind of default uh, FFI or, or foreign function interface. It's just real low level. You can import a shared library or a module and call the function, but if your types don't line up, you have to do some manual trickery. And uh, that's where SWIG comes in. SWIG stands for Simplified Wrapper and Interface Generator. And it's more of a generic tool that will wrap C code and expose it to a bunch of high, a bunch of high level languages like Perl, Python, Ruby, Erlang, Tickle, all sorts of crazy stuff. And what it does is it, it, wrap, it adds an additional layer that helps uh, uh, convert your types from your Python types to maybe uh, something defined in C and it also does some minimal type checking. And then there's Cypon. We didn't invent, but Cypon. I like the name of it. What it. What's really cool about Cypon is that its its grammar will be a complete superset of the Python language. And what it what it does is it allows you to write normal Python code and then augment it with 
uh, type information and then run it through the Cypon compiler and you get out C code that you compile into a library and you can. But what that additional type information does is, if you, uh, for example, if you were to define a, a variable that was used only as an integer in Python code, Python doesn't know that it's only going to be used for an integer, so it uses its generic Python folder. Now, with, with this additional constraint through the compiler, the compiler says, oh, he, he's, Chris has told me this is only going to be an integer. I'll use a native integer, and I'll do native operations on it. And then the, uh, I think Sage, which is a scientific group, they, they use it heavily to really accelerate their Python. The point is, Python makes it really easy to reuse uh, C code. In a standard library, you know, if, if languages came in a box, most languages would say battery is not included in the corner. And Python is, is loaded with, with standard libraries right out of the box. And I just picked a few here. URL, it, you know, the full URL uh, parsing and the ability to retrieve these resources. Comes with parsers, XML, HTML. Uh, comes with a version of Lex and Yak, so if you have your own DNF grammar, you can make sure you parse it. And then multi processing, multi processing um, that's infrastructure to help distribute the computing uh, for multi core and multi node. I'm pretty neat stuff. So, okay. Another quick thing. Uh, we'll use URL to uh, go out and grab a quick stock book from. Yahoo provides a web service that returns plain text, comma separated uh, value. So, first thing is to import the URL, loop. and then we'll, we'll use a, a for loop. So, for the result in now URL lib, so URL open um, returns something that can be iterated upon. So, the for loop will iterate this, and result will be set until URL open returns up in the screen. And I have it here with the cheat sheet. So. Does anybody know Apple's? Did they find out Apple symbol? APPL or A? A A P L. Okay, that's what I thought. Apple. So the Apple and do it. and the last traded price. This, in, this interpreter is built right into the uh, presentation software. And this comes back in an easily parsable format. Um, we could then split that, put it into a dictionary if we wanted to record it, you know, have a histogram of the stock symbol to quotes over time or something. Just it. Uh, there's also, so in addition to the standard library, there's like I said, a kind of third party library. These, these are some places where you can go and get to um, Python source code, PyPy. So that's kind of like CPAN for Perl or uh, Ruby or Gems for Ruby. And then obviously Google and source for the rest of the internet. Are we okay on time or are we gotta no, it's five minutes, but we just keep going with it. Um, so now Python is kind of how we use it. We obviously we use it on our target to drive our applications, but we also use it for our development tools. Um, 
typically build and development tools will not be written in C. It's just too cumbersome for the string and file handling. Um, but Python suited for both, so that's nice. And then the language reuse enables and, and, and actually encourages code reuse. So we have tools that we we'll use on the target as well as part of our uh, build steps, or development steps. Um, there's also, like, there's basically a software company in a can with Python. You know, that's written in Python. You can you track, which is your bug tracking system. You can use it. There's Bazaar, which is your software version control. Uh, there's BuildBot, which is something we use so that after every check in, uh, we'll compile all our code, package it, put it on the target, and run integration tests. And that's after every check in by anybody. And that actually happens across uh, several couple branches of software. So that, uh, so we can point the person This is just a really high level view of our software stack. Um, what's in green is Python. And um, so we have a mix here where some of our device drivers are in Python and then we wrap the I.O. driver in C or, or and then we have legacy code that's in C that we've wrapped in Python. Uh, we're moving more towards this. And, and even such that, you know, this layer is not necessarily needed in all cases if, um, if, you know, if you're accessing a driver through a file descriptor or a socket, Python can do that. If it's memory mapped, you can map that right in just like you can see in access to it. Um, some of the third party, just a sample of the third party libraries we use. Uh, Twisted, really cool, it's our IPC. And Remote, uh, remote object system. So um, between any, two, between like say the map, the line, boss card, the common controller master card, and the line card slate, we can pass a Python object, and maybe it has methods, and then the line card can call those and happen over here. So full transparency, and we, we uh, pass all our objects through that way. Do that. Um, it also comes with a ton of built-in goodies like uh, a web server. And we actually use that for our internal debug web server, so and then hook all our data structures up to it, so we can go to our debug port and have this rich view of what's really going on in the system, as opposed to you know poking around the command line. It does provide a command line. In addition, it also has SSH clients and servers and, and a bunch more. Uh, Django that's that's a web templating framework similar to Ruby on Rails. Uh, we use that for our Customer facing website. Really ways in it. And then just another example, Pi SNMP. Uh, SNMP is a protocol for, I don't know if you guys are familiar with it, but it's a whole protocol stack. And, and we're basically able to take this, it's already written in Python, licensed correctly, we just very little code integrated into our system, and now we're uh, an SNMP aware box. So, Overall, um, we didn't start out as, as thinking we would be Python focused. Um, so we all had C and C++ backgrounds, but um, our CTO Steve had used Python in a project for a prototype, and he suggested that we uh, maybe prototype some of our uh, upcoming features in Python first. And um, we're basically really happy with how fast we were able to develop it and uh, how few bugs we encountered. And so it was more and more and more became Python. Uh, so much to the point that now we're in the process of taking some of the code that was written in C and C++ and converting it to Python. So it's really cool because we already took the effort to do it in C. We can have a comparison. We have actual proof that this much C code C++ code, you know, is now only this much Python code. Um, and performance has not been an issue, so, I mean, overall we've been uh, very happy. And then Python has many, you know, just use Python to do game programming or scientific analysis, statistics, you know, it's obviously used on the web, utilities. And that was my fancy transition, but this entire presentation was in Python using Bruce, just a text markup document, 